Our program is really special today because it coincides with International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Today is International Holocaust Remembrance Day, and we're very lucky here at the National World War II Museum to have a very special exhibit happening right now. That special exhibit is Violins of Hope. We're gonna talk about Violins of Hope. We're gonna hear from a violinist who's gonna play a song for us on one of the violins, and then we're gonna learn about music in the Holocaust. So to get started today, let's learn about Violins of Hope. So Violins of Hope's first appearance in New Orleans is hosted here at the National World War II Museum. It's in commemoration of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, and we're sponsored by Toby Philanthropies as a part of the Toby Family Holocaust Education Program. Violins of Hope is a project of concerts based on a private collection of violins, violas, violas and, a, and cellos all collected since the end of World War II, many of which belong to Jewish people before and during the war. Violins of Hope aims to teach audiences about the Holocaust through music and culture using a private collection of violins, violas, and cellos. Rescued from the Holocaust and lovingly, lovingly restored by father-son team and renowned violin makers, Amnon and Avshi Weinstein. Each of these instruments belonged to Jewish music musicians before and during the war. Many of them were donated by or brought from survivors. Some arrived through family members and several simply came carrying Stars of David as a decoration and identity tag. Each instrument tells a story, such as the violin that was thrown out of a cattle train on way from France to Auschwitz, the violin that was buried under the snow in Holland, and the violin that saved the lives of people who played in a concentration camp orchestra. These instruments serve as a testament to death, survival, and hope. Through the display and playing of these instruments, Violins of Hope is a moving tribute to the more than 6 million Jewish people who were murdered in the Holocaust. The Weinsteins have dedicated their expertise and passion to ensuring that these instruments are preserved for future generations to enjoy and reflect on their significance to history. For Amnon Weinstein, the restoration of these violins has been a labor of love, dedicated to family members who perished in the Holocaust. His father was also an expert violin maker, immigrated to Palestine in 1938, leaving behind 400 relatives in Eastern Europe, all of whom were killed in the Holocaust. More than anyone, the Weinsteins understood the virtuosity and spirit of those musicians who were silenced by the Holocaust. And those memories now live through these carefully restored instruments. So on your screens here are the father-son duo, the Weinsteins, and they're the men who are really restoring these violins and are really taking care of them. But today we're gonna have a member of the Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra playing one of those violins that has been restored for you today. The violin will be, that will be played is the Katrine, or the flowers violin. So this violin that y'all are gonna see in just a second live being played has a very special story to it. The origin of this violin, however, is not very well known, but it once belonged to a young Jewish boy who escaped from Poland to a small village in Belgium. Orphaned and alone, only his violin for company, he sought refuge with a family in Brussels. One day he disappeared, leaving behind his sole possession on the bed in his rented room. Eyewitnesses claimed that the German authorities had arrested him, and the phone homeowners would give the violin to their niece, Catherine. After the war, her aunt explained the instrument's sorrowful history years later, and Catherine vowed to never play it again. She walked to a field bordering the village, opened the case, whispered an improvised prayer before closing the lid for the final time, she would place a bouquet of flowers on top of the violin. The instrument would remain untouched for decades until Catherine learned about the violins of hope. And on a French television broadcast, she saw this and decided to reach out to Amon, and he would eventually preserve and restore this violin in memory of the owner. The Weinsteins discovered when they opened up the violin that dried flowers were actually embedded in the violin's body, and they still remain embedded there today. So this violin, which we're going to see in just a second, is going to be played by Benjamin Hart. Benjamin Hart began playing violin at age five in his hometown of St. Louis, Missouri. He would join the Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra, which you can see pictured here. And the Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra, he would join as an associate concert master in January of 2013. Ben earned his master's in music from Indiana University in 2012, where he studied with an acclaimed concert and soloist, Alexander Kurt. The Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra was actually founded in 1991, and it is the oldest full-time musician-governed and collaboratively operated orchestra in the United States. The LPO offers a full 36-week season with more than 120 performances, and there are 67 musicians in the orchestra. 
In addition to playing music by composers like Mozart and Beethoven, they also perform with local bands like Tank and the Bangas and Big Frida. They also present favorite films and play scores alongside them like Harry Potter, Home Alone, and Star Wars. And they teach instruments in schools through the Music for Life program. They offer music therapy for those who are unable to attend music concerts as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to our musician, Ben, and he's gonna come up and play a very special song on that flowers violin in just a second. Hi everyone, glad to be here with you. I'm gonna play uh, for you Remembrances by John Williams from Schindler's List. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Isabel Mann, and I am the Teacher Programs and Curriculum Specialist here at the National World War II Museum. Um, and we're going to uh, wrap up this webinar with a brief discussion about music and the Holocaust. And in particular, we're going to talk about the role that music played uh, in resistance during World War II and the Holocaust. Um, and in order to do that, um, we are going to talk about uh, how to define resistance during the Holocaust, how Jewish individuals uh, resisted the Nazis and their collaborators during uh, this time period. Um, and so we're gonna dive in defining resistance by going through a broad definition of resistance first. Um, so resistance can be defined as the refusal to accept or comply with something. Um, or the attempt to prevent something by action or argument. And there were many different ways that people resisted and Jewish individuals resisted during the Holocaust. Everything from smuggling food into ghettos and concentration camps um, to individuals joining underground resistance groups where they took up arms um, and attempted to sabotage uh, the Nazis' war efforts during World War II. Now, when people think about resistance during the Holocaust, they tend to think about a specific type of resistance. They tend to think about organized armed resistance. Um, and we do see lots of Jewish individuals during World War II and the Holocaust take up arms and physically resist the Nazis and their collaborators. But this was not the only kind of resistance during World War II and the Holocaust. We also see a type of resistance called spiritual resistance during uh, the Holocaust. Now, spiritual resistance can be defined as attempts to preserve the history and cultural life of the Jewish people, despite Nazi efforts to eliminate the Jews from human memory. Now, the Holocaust was a genocide. And so what this means is that they were not only trying to uh, deport Jewish individuals to ghettos and concentration camps, they were not only uh, murdering many Jewish individuals, but they were trying to totally eliminate Jewish culture and the memory of Jewish people from the world. Um, and so one way that Jewish individuals resisted is by uh, resisting the Nazis attempt to do away with their culture by preserving that culture and practicing it and practicing their religion. Um, so some examples of spiritual resistance include uh, continuing to practice Jewish religious holidays, uh, even in ghettos and concentration camps. Um, collecting and hiding documentation of Jewish traditions um, and Jewish experiences before and during uh, their time in ghettos and concentration camps, creating art, uh, holding school and secret, even though school was forbidden in ghettos and concentration camps, and then, of course, performing music. And to really give you a sense of, <clears throat> to really give you a sense of what spiritual resistance was, during the Holocaust, we're gonna hear from an individual Holocaust survivor uh, whose name is Ella Weisberger. Ella was born in 1930 in Czechoslovakia to a Jewish family. Uh, and when she was a young child, her life changed forever when the Nazis rose to power in Germany uh, and then annexed or occupied where Ella and her family were living. Uh, once the Nazis rose to power, um, Ella and her family had to register as Jews. 
they had to start wearing a yellow star to identify them in public. Um, and Ella was expelled from school. She was no longer allowed to attend school. And then when she was 11, she and several members of her family were deported to a camp and a ghetto uh, called Theresienstadt. Now, it was at Theresienstadt that Ella uh, was forced to perform in a children's opera called Brun de Bar. Um, this was an opera that was smuggled into the camp, uh, but then the Nazis used it to try to deceive the Red Cross into believing that nothing bad was going on in Theresienstadt. Um, but even though Ella was uh, forced to perform this opera for the Nazis, um, while she was performing, she was actually allowed to take off her yellow star. And this was the only time that she really felt like she had a little bit of freedom because she was not marked. Now, in this oral history clip, she's going to talk a little bit about the role that music played for her and her mom uh, to make them feel like they still had some dignity when they were interned or incarcerated at Therese and Stott. Um, and so Maddie is going to uh, play this oral history clip for you. But the one day, this I will mention, I had to use the bathroom and uh, I heard very different singing, you know, like. So in the courtyard of the barrack were about 30 uh, caskets with dead people. And a rabbi was holding one candle and said the prayer. I never saw something like that before. But in such a hard time, people try to let people go to their death, you know, with dignity. What the Nazis couldn't stop. So uh, I learned through all that as a very young child that we should preserve our dignity, not to let the Nazis do what they wanted. Uh, so we heard from Ella there a little bit about the role that music and art played during her time at Therese and Stott. You know, she talks there at the end about how it was one way that she was able to preserve her dignity and to say to the Nazis in that way, you can't take that from me. You can't take this from me as much as you might want to try. Um, and so for her, uh, music and singing was a way that she resisted. Um, and so now we're going to go into a little bit of the role that music played as resistance uh, in different parts of the Holocaust. We're going to talk a little bit about music in ghettos and camps, as well as music and hiding. Um, and so the camp where uh, Ella was incarcerated and her family was incarcerated was Therese and Stott. And so I want to talk a little bit about that camp and ghetto. Therese and Stott uh, was a camp and ghetto. It fits many of the features of both a concentration camp and a ghetto. And it was at this location where many Jewish artists, musicians, uh, and intellectuals were incarcerated. Um, and so while they were at Therese and Stott, despite the horrible living conditions, we see many of the Jewish artists, writers, musicians, and actors uh, continue to uh, perform their art, continue to cultivate their art. And so we see this in many different ways. One of the ways that uh, Jewish artists resisted and Theresa Stott is they actually started a secret school for the cho children who were at Theresa Stott. They taught children at the camp in secret, even though it was forbidden and being found out would have a high cost. Um, and they taught children how to uh, draw, how to paint, um, how to play instruments, um, how to write poetry. And not only that, but adult Jewish artists continue to create art despite the harsh living conditions. Now, there were about 15,000 children who were deported to Therese and Stott. Uh, and unfortunately, about 90% of those children were later 
later murdered during the war. In many ways, Theresienstadt was a transit camp. Um, and so these children were sent to Theresienstadt for a time period, but ultimately many of the people who were sent to Theresienstadt were then deported um, to camps further east um, where they were eventually murdered. Now, one of the examples of a piece of art that was created at Theresienstadt is pictured here on this slide. Um, this is a still life of a violin and sheet music behind prison bars, and it was created uh, or drawn by uh, a woman named Biedrich Frieda. Uh, she was a Jewish artist who, while living in the Theresienstadt camp during World War II, created drawings and paintings uh, that mostly depicted the horrible living conditions in Theresienstadt. But we see uh, in this picture, in this drawing, um, we see a ray of hope here. Um, in this uh, image, we see a violin and a sheet of music, but then we also see rays of sunlight coming out behind the prison bars. Um, and so we can kind of see how for Frida and for many other people in Theresienstadt, despite the horrible living conditions, they were still resisting and they were still trying to find hope, this very human thing, um, in the music um, that they were performing and continuing to do, uh, sometimes in secret as well. Um, and so now we're gonna hear again from Ella. Uh, this time she's, she is gonna talk about uh, herself and her mom uh, and a little bit about the role that uh, music played, uh, a little bit more about the role that music played in Trees and Stott. And so Maddie is going to, to pull that clip up for us. I was very lucky that I was singing in this children's opera, Brunjiba. And how did that come about? When I came to Terezin, I was one of the first children. And this is also something, when I came to Prague, I, my uncle had a friend. That friend loved that I sang for him Czech, you know, songs. But he said uh, that there is a synagogue in Prague and that I should join the children's chorus. I did. Every Friday, I had to come to this uh, friend of my uncle. And there is a very special song for Sabbath. And I had to sing him that song. I remember it still today. But when I came to Teradin, there was another play, The Fireflies. And there was a dancer and a very special person for us, Camilla Rodenbaum. And when she was teaching at Waltz from the melody from Brunjibarn, I came to my mother at night for a couple hours. They let us visit mothers in the camp. So I would say to her, you know, make free this little piece and we will dance. What do you want to dance with me? And I said, waltz. And we were waltzing. My mother kicked off her shoes, the wooden shoes, and she was, well, you know, Everything was for my mother also very special. And I don't know how many performances she was able to come to see me. Because in Terezin, the audience was different than in the whole world. When they saw us get to come on stage and to sing the victory song, we became strong and we became, you know, we will win this war against the Hitler who was Brunjiba. And this is still today in the minds of survivors that they saw Brunjiba in Terezin. And so Ella very beautifully described there 
uh, how music and dancing with her mom helped to kind of return their humanity and their dignity that the Nazis were trying to take away. And it also gave them hope that they could win the war, that they would make it through, that they would survive. Um, now, Ella was talking about her experience of music in a camp and a ghetto, um, but we also see that music plays a role in resistance outside of camps and ghettos as well. Uh, many Jewish individuals uh, were able to survive the war because they were able to go into hiding. Um, and this included people who were artists, musicians, and composers. And so I want to highlight a specific individual uh, by the name of Joseph Beer. Joseph Beer was a popular and successful composer of operas in Austria. Um, he uh, composed his first comic operas in the early 1920s, and they were met with huge success. Um, these first operas included The Prince of Shiraz and The Polish Wedding. After uh, his first few very successful operas, he became ranked uh, among Vienna's, Austria's most sought after composers. Um, but his very promising career was sh cut short when Austria was added to Nazi Germany in 1938. Right away, all of his beautiful uh, works of art were banned simply because he was Jewish and he was the one who composed this music. Uh, knowing that uh, he would be persecuted under the Nazis, he decided to flee to France. Uh, and then when France fell to Germany in 1940, that is when he decided to go into hiding. Um, he was able to acquire a false identity card. Uh, so he was able to live in a sm uh, small apartment under this false identity. Um, and you can see that false identity card pictured here on that slide. Uh, instead of going by Joseph Beer, uh, he went by Jean Joseph instead. Now, while he was living and hiding, he continued to compose music to uh, pay his way, uh, to pay his way through. Um, and it was the money that he earned from composing that music uh, that allowed him to survive the war. The, but the music that he composed during uh, this time, uh, he was not able to sell as his own work. He actually sold it to other non-Jewish musicians um, who claimed that music as their own. But that was the only way that he was able to both continue to compose music and make enough money to survive until the end of the war. Now, when the Allied forces liberated France in 1944, uh, that is when Joseph learned about the fate of the rest of his family. Um, he learns that his mother, father, and sister were all murdered at Auschwitz. Um, and so after the war, uh, he became very isolated from the rest of the music community. He decided that he would no longer have any major venues stage any of his works. Um, and in his later years, he became very isolated and insisted on working alone to compose any other music. Um, so that's a little uh, uh, an example of how someone continued to compose music, uh, even in hiding, and even used that music um, to help him survive uh, during World War II. Uh, and now I want to go into <clears throat> um, how the role that music plays in our memory of the Holocaust and individuals who lived through the Holocaust today. Music is a powerful way that we can remember uh, the individuals who lived through something like the Holocaust. Now, today, music can help us remember and tell the stories of all of these individuals that we've talked about today. Um, for instance, music can help us remember Joseph Beer, who I was just talking about. Uh, his daughter, Beatrice Beer, is actually a famous opera singer today, um, and she regularly performs the music that he composed before and during the war to help remember her father and his story. It's one way that she keeps his memory, his story alive. Violence of Hope, which we talked about at the beginning of the webinar, is another way that we are keeping the memory of the Holocaust and these individuals alive. Violence of Hope not only preserves the instruments used by Jewish individuals during the Holocaust, but it brings these individual stories to life by playing these instruments, by playing the music that was created by Jewish individuals during the Holocaust. And by doing that, we're not only remembering these individuals, but we're carrying on the resistance, their resistance, of continuing to play music, of continuing to say, I have dignity, 
even when they had this group of people trying to take that away from them. With Violence of Hope, by listening to this music, playing this music, we're carrying on that resistance that they started a long time ago during the Holocaust itself. Um, so we do want to end with uh, one last video clip from Ella. Um, just to close out the webinar, uh, we want to end with uh, the rest of her story um, and her talking about uh, music and memory. So Maddie's going to go ahead and play that clip. I don't know if you heard about Ilze Weber. Ilze Weber was from a Czech German town, you know, so she spoke German and also Czech. She smuggled into Theresienstadt a little guitar. She wrote poems and music and she became a nurse to babies in Terezin and young children. Now we were singing many of her songs in Czech, but somehow one of the songs was about friends. And I had already my little girl and my son. They had friends, a lot of friends, but they, they never felt what is it to lose a good friend. So one day I decided, and with my not such a good English, I will translate this little poem. So it's you and I, and we are friends. You and I, and we love each other. In Terezin, we met. Friends in need, hand in hand. And you and I, friends, we still be. And you and I shall never forget. So I'm asking, please remember my friends. <laughs>